up, everyone, and welcome to It's Called Soccer, a podcast where we talk about everything happening in U.S. soccer. Today, we have an action-packed episode. We're talking about the new sporting director, Matt Crocker, that has been hired by U.S. Soccer Federation, and his deputy, now revealed to be Aguchi Onyewu, the VP of Sporting. Sounds made up. I think it is, but we'll talk about that today and what they're both going to be doing to hire the next uh, USMNT manager. Also, the U-20 Men's World Cup roster has been released. The games start later this month. So we'll talk all about that roster. Who are the players to watch? Who are the players that missed out? There's some big names. Ricardo Pepe was not on that list. Paxton Aronson was not on that list. So find out why they're not with the team and how that's going to impact our chances at the U-20 World Cup. And finally, we will wrap up with some very interesting rumors. Hmm. Christian Pulisic seems to be on the move from Chelsea. He is not getting consistent playing time. We've heard Napoli, Juventus, Newcastle. I think Ellie said before we started recording that it's easier to name clubs that aren't interested in Christian Pulisic because that list might be shorter. And Yunus Musa has some suitors in the Premier League. Valencia is on the cusp of being relegated from La Liga. They're tied on points with the drop zone and just one position ahead. So where will Yunus Musa be going? Serginho Dest is going to be out at Barcelona. So all of the big names at USMNT might be on the move this summer. We'll talk about where they're going to go, what the most up-to-date rumors are. But before we get to all of that, we got to see how we're doing. I'm going to start with the future doctor of the universe, Tom Godden. How are you, man? Dude, I'm doing great. My semester ended uh, last week. And uh, as you can see, it's been a struggle. I've been growing my struggle beard out, as I do at the end of every single semester. But I got through That's it. That's a struggle for... beard? A little bit. For yeah. anyone listening, Tom looks incredibly dapper and <laughs> like the beard was was shaped by a professional <laughs> yeah no this is just two weeks of unregulated growth here but yeah uh very stressful so end of the semester <laughs> but we're done now we're good it's just on to summer research and my qualifying exam here which would period to chill nice ellie downstairs from tom ellie godden how are you i'm good i'm good you know school year's wrapping up we're Getting to summertime, starting summer camps. Um, and Chattanooga FC is in absolute full swing. Women's team starts in about two weeks, one week, 10 days, something like that. Um, yeah. Um, and so we're it's we're staying busy down here in, in Tennessee. <laughs> Are you going to be capoing for the women's team also? Oh, yeah. Every single oh, game. Anything That's a I lot. Can- Hands on. Hey, double header right. games are the kickers. Those are the hard ones. The days where you go back to back, but they are the best. Everyone is Speaking. in it. Go on. Go on. Sorry. No, I mean, everyone's in it together. You walk out and everyone, you can just see everyone dragging and it's like, well, you know. Ellie, I feel like we need a, a good nickname for you if Tom is the future doctor of the universe. What, what are we, what are you? <laughs> All right, people in the chat, let let us know, and also be nice. I'll delete anything that that, uh, isn't isn't good. Best name wins. Best name starts the next episode. All right, let's talk about the sporting director. BetOnline.ag is your number one source for all of your basketball information, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest player reports for this year's pro basketball playoffs. Bet Online is always your sports information headquarters this season, as we have you covered for all of your sports wagering needs, basketball, Major League Baseball, NHL hockey, right to UFC, boxing, and the best sport on earth, soccer. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information, including live betting options and your favorite casino and car games you can play right from your own home. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Be sure to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Please gamble responsibly. For U.S. soccer, Matt Crocker. He has experience, guys. He's been a coach. He's been involved in U.S. soccer before, has been abroad in the U.S. He is English. Um, Also oversaw a lot of the youth squads for the English national team. Created the English DNA That gave us such great players as Jude Bellingham, as Jack Grealish, 
players that have come through the youth system in England and won them world championships at the youth level. Also was most recently the sporting director at Southampton. Now we can talk about what Southampton looks like this year. It's pretty much a mess, Um, but he was involved in the potential hiring of Jesse Marsh going to Southampton to end the season. So I'm wondering what you guys think about one, this hire of Matt Crocker. Is this better, worse, or just different from the previous sporting directors that we've had that have kind of been part of the club of U S soccer. And then two, does Matt Crocker's hire mean that maybe we're more in for Jesse Marsh than, than we thought before? Maybe Ellie, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, I think it's a positive. I looking at, I, I got really excited when I saw his name pop across as not a part of the U S um, kind of like in club, I guess that group of players that everyone knows and they all know each other and, right where we've kind of come into a lot of issues because they're all so interconnected and so it's really nice to see and having read up a little bit about him I mean I think that the having read that he has built such a nice program for England um, I'm really hopeful that he'll get to come in and really build off of our 2022 World Cup and build off of this Women's World Cup and hopefully develop the excitement that is already kind of developing in the U.S. for soccer. Um, and so I see it as hopeful. Um, and I, I'm the more I hear about everyone in USSF, the more I hear rumors about Jesse Marsh, and the more to me it becomes kind of evident that that's the direction we're heading in. And honestly, I'm not super mad. I'm cool with that. Sounds fun. Why not? Let's try it. <laughs> Is this the time to try stuff, though, with 2026 on the horizon? Tom, what do you think of the hire? I like it. I I appreciate the fact that no one knew who this guy was, until, at least in U.S. circles, until the hiring was announced. Um, but since then, I feel like everything I've heard has been positive. Every interview I've watched, he's saying all the right things. He um, seems to be carrying himself the way I would want the sporting director to be carrying themselves. Uh, his record with Southampton is really great from their youth programs through the women's team, who I think got promoted two years in a row under him all the way up through the men's team prior to this year. Uh, it seems that he knows how to build a consistent vision from youth all the way up through the senior teams. And he also seems to have a very nice data-driven approach that I personally very much appreciate uh, as a data-driven person myself. So yeah, it, it seems like a great hire to me. It, it's really nice that we dug through a pool of candidates. There's a million of these people out there and found someone who seems to be able to do the job that we want very well. I was surprised at the speed of this hire. I wasn't necessarily expecting a sporting director this soon and this early. Now he has said in interviews that he's going to wait until the European season is ended so that we can take a full look at what coaches are available and potentially what coaches are interested. Now we find ourselves at a place we're at the beginning of the summer, the European season is about to end. So while we know we can pretty much assume that Jesse Marsh is at least going to be a part of the interview process and be considered for this role, I think his experience in Europe, knowing what is at stake for the USMNT, at least I'm talking about the men's side specifically now with 2026 coming up, I do think there's going to be a more measured approach than just, hey, I like Jesse Marsh. I wanted to bring him to Southampton. That's going to be my guy for the USMNT. I think there is going to be a consideration for a lot of other coaches that might be available and might be interested in the role. Um, I I think it's a pretty good hire. A lot of what you guys said rings true to me is the fact that nobody knew this guy uh, in U.S. circles, the fact that he's not in the in club at U.S. soccer, that that's kind of in its own way a benefit to to all of this process. Now, Gucci Onyewu is a really interesting addition to this team because He is the VP of sporting. So if Matt Crocker is the president of sporting, Aguchi Anyewu is the vice president of sporting. And Aguchi Anyewu's roles and responsibilities from the U.S. Soccer Federation uh, says that he'll be assisting in the hiring of the USMNT coach, uh, the U.S. manager, and he'll also be responsible for fundraising with the, the charity arm or the fundraising arm of the nonprofit for U.S. soccer. Um, So, Personally, Aguchi Anyewu, I've liked what he has to say on uh, in Soccer We Trust, the CBS podcast with Jimmy Conrad and Charlie Davies and all of that. I think we're kind of moving in the right direction. Does this give you the same 
like butterfly positive feelings that it's giving me? Kind of does. I, I, I'm kind of liking what I'm seeing so far from Onyewu and from Crocker. Uh, I think that specifically the part I'm most excited about with Onyewu is it seems like his role is going to be more negotiating with uh, clubs around the world to negotiate releases for players. And, you know, a player who's played all over Europe, who has experience with the national team, who has played for clubs like Milan even, is uh, a huge advantage for that position. He knows the schedule of a pro player. He knows the demands of these pro clubs in addition to you know, having experience with the U.S. player pool. So I think that he's going to be a very good person for that role specifically. Ellie, what do, what's your positive momentum factor uh, or negative or neutral? I don't know. I uh, was really excited with Matt Crocker. I'm slightly more um, like I'm a little more hesitant with um, Aguchi Anyewu just because he is so connected in the community because like looking back and he's played with, you know, a lot of those players, he's played in, our, in World Cups, things like that. And I'm slightly more hesitant because that's where we've gotten a lot of our drama. And I, even at a VP level, like that's a step down from director, but it's still a space where you can have that kind of drama and you don't want drama anywhere. Um, especially after everything we've gone through um, in these World Cup cycles and we've been building on in MLS and, just everywhere. I, I'm i slightly more hesitant with Anyewu, but so far I haven't, like, I'm, I'm hopeful. I don't, I, it's not screaming, like, throw all the emergency, start right. running, hi, this is bad. Like, I'm, I'm hopeful that Matt Crocker and Anyewu will work well together and that we'll end up with a team that one knows kind of what the program looks like, um, and can speak to it a little bit more, and one who is willing to kind of say, hey, this is what we've had in the past, but that's not who we are right now, and I'm okay with going outside the bounds of that because we don't need that. And so I'm hopeful that together they'll end up working really well and end up kind of balancing each other out and creating a really good program. I do think those concerns are fair, though, that the problem before has been people way too connected to the game. I guess my counterpoint would be that there there is kind of a generational difference between like the the Brian McBride and Eric Guinalda era versus the Aguchi Anyewu. He was even like, I would put him in the Michael Bradley era, which is still going somehow at Toronto. <laughs> like An Anyewu has been more recent and not necessarily within that, that in club of like really incestuous, like friendships, relationship, like literally relationships yeah. uh, with the the Winalda era. I feel like Anyewu and just listening to what that group has had to say on the show with Jimmy Conrad, Charlie Davies, um, Heath Pierce, it seems like they're way more able to voice concerns and really bring, bring those concerns to the public. Um, whereas with a lot of other people that were a little bit more connected to that other generation, it seems like there was a lot of protection going on of hey, this is my guy. I'm not going to say anything bad about him. Where, like, these are former players, Charlie Davies, Anyewu, Heath Pierce, Jimmy Conrad, that are all, like, more than happy to voice their concerns about U.S. soccer and, and where the direction is that it's headed. So in that respect, I'm I'm happy that Anyewu, if anyone that's connected to U.S. soccer has been a player before, Anyewu is part of that group that that becomes that. But I do think that's still totally fair, that that pain is still fresh on our minds with the Reina situation, with everything that happened after the World Cup and the fallout. I think it's fair to to be concerned and to have that pain, that that wound, still be open. Uh, now, I'm curious to see how this all affects the women's team. Um, I feel like there's a lot of people, a lot of connections with the men's team here, but hmm. I'd be really interested to see if there's a new direction coming for the women's team that's more youth-focused, more development-focused than I think we have been in the past, especially with the new CBA just being ratified. I feel like there's room for Crocker to take the women's team in a very special new direction that's, yeah. I, I think, interesting. So I also think it possibly means that we're probably not, I, we're possibly not going to bring Black going and Andonofsky back after this World Cup. Yeah, it's a good point. And Blacko is going to be kind of my response to that is, you know, he's he's kind of been like good enough to not get fired, but that's that's like the ceiling <laughs> that he's been at. Um, yeah. where he's done a good enough job to not have his job be under scrutiny constantly, even yeah. though we are 
we are going to talk about his performances at the World Cup. Like they're living and dying with with his job. Um, yeah. But I agree. Like if we're if we're thinking about generational gaps with the U.S. men's team, we think about you know the generation of Megan Rapino is kind of falling off the the age gap on the far side, and then we don't necessarily have a middle group. Like maybe Julie Ertz is one of the the last people that are kind of like in that late twenties, early thirties range. But Rose Lavelle's in there, core, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, like there's three or four people that are kind of the core of the team at the moment, but yeah, it does seem that there's going to have to be some transition to that younger group, to the Trinity Rodman, Alyssa Thompson, like all of these people that need to start building into the senior team. And that's not necessarily how the women's team has worked before. Like we've always had someone that's in their prime in almost every position. Whereas now we almost have to be more, more consistent in driving that development. Okay. Let's talk about the youth teams then. U20, uh, the U.S. is on their way to Argentina. They've just had their first uh, practice in Argentina. They're going to be taking on, let's see, uh, (laughs) Fiji, Ecuador, and Slovakia, I think. Let me, can someone fact check me on Slovakia, on that being the last game? Uh, But I have the roster here. While you fact check me, I'm going to talk about the goalkeepers, defenders, midfielders, and forwards. Goalkeeper, we have Alex Borto, player at Fulham, Antonio Carrera, and Gaga Salmina, the player that got sold from Chicago Fire to Chelsea. We have Hoffenheim defender Justin Shea, Brandon Craig, Mauricio Cuevas, Jonathan Gomez, Caleb Wiley, Joshua Winder. You like that, Winder? I got it right this time. <laughs> and then in midfielders, Daniel Edelman, the Red Bull guy. Diego Luna, Jack McGlynn, Rokas Pukstas, Nico Sar... <sighs> Nico <laughs> Sakiris, <laughs> Obed Vargas, Owen Wolf. And then at forward, we have Cade Cowell, Kevin Paredes, Quinn Sullivan, and Darren Yappy. Uh, let's talk about this roster because for me, there's very few defensive midfielders and there's very few center forwards. We also know that Cade Cowell is going to be suspended for the first two matches of the group stage and that Rokas Pukstas, one of the best players on this roster, is not going to be joining this team until at least the last group stage game, but probably the knockout rounds because his club is in a cup competition and won't release him until then. So two of our best players, two of our most important players are going to be out until the knockout rounds. Are we still good enough? as well, probably, right? Yeah, I mean... Wolfsburg has a game right before the group stage kicks off. Uh, we don't know Wolfsburg's status, but Kevin Paredes has been like the first off the bench for Wolfsburg. So I doubt that they're going to release him for that first first game. So we're down a few and we're bringing three goalkeepers even. So we're, we're maybe talking about 14 or 15 field players to be playing the first two or three matches in the group stage. Um, all right. First opinions, perspectives of this roster. How good is this? And should we be worried at all about the group stage and how many players that we're missing? I I am feeling pretty positive about this roster. I mean, I think that this is a little bit stronger of a roster than even I anticipated. We were trying to go through uh before this uh roster was announced, the ins and the outs that I had players like Paredes and uh Pukstas. And I think even Securus on the outs, so we're, we're not going to be released by their clubs, too important to their club situation to be make the trip. I think I even had Edelman in that same group. So I was a little bit worried that there were going to be a lot of strong players that we couldn't bring because their clubs just needed them a little bit too much in both MLS and in Europe. So even having some of those players available for one or two games down the road is huge for our chances, given who we're missing off this roster. So you know, it's a youth tournament. It's always going to be a mixed bag, but given what we could have had, this is a really strong roster. Ellie, what are you thinking going into this tournament? I'm excited. Um, I'm, I think I'm most excited for Justin Che, Jonathan Gomez and Caleb Wiley um, to see all three of them and see kind of where they fall in this, this situation and see almost what that speaks to for the national for like the the senior national team and I'm going to be watching the three of them to see where they line up how they do and if they deserve that call up in the future because I think that's a really big deal I think those three are my biggest watch right now and I think overall I think it's a really strong lineup um I looked at it and I was like this is 
this looks like a really good group. Like, I think that we got this, like I've heard a lot of names and I, I was very pleasantly surprised as someone who is still learning everything that, um, that I was able to look at this list and be like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I got yeah. these. I think I know a lot of these names. <laughs> and for anyone that might just be dipping their toe into the world of youth, soccer and kind of the under 23s u20s u17s of the u.s the 2019 edition of this tournament is one of the most fun tournaments that i've had following u.s soccer uh there was like serginio des timothy wea gio reina and we we got to the the quarterfinal stage we beat france in the round of 16 in an insane match and then we we lost a close game in that quarterfinal that was one of the most fun teams. Timothy Way was cooking that tournament. So I can't wait to see what this group is going to do because it feels like there, there were a lot of big names that we're able to know now because we're four years in the future. We've seen them with the senior team, people that have breakouts or maybe uh, developed a little bit differently. But this team right now, I mean, you, you can make a case that almost every single one of them is getting senior team minutes or on the cusp of doing that. And that's not always what you could say about our U20 squad. Um, so Tom, maybe I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Who, who are like the two or three names that don't necessarily have that senior, senior minutes behind them that you think are going to make the step in this tournament? I think you have to look at, um, uh, let's, let's go with the midfielders here. I think that's where I'm sort of looking to see players break out. Um, players like Nico Securis are playing almost up an age group. I think, uh, Diego Luna is another one. Yeah, yeah, Vargas, Vargas, and uh, Luna. Those are sort of the three that I sort of see as playing really like fringe minutes with their MLS teams right now, but are right on the cusp of really breaking out. Um, there's some other names that you could talk about. Jonathan Gomez, of course, is still trying to break in in Sociedad, um, just now sort of getting on the bench for the first team, playing a lot of minutes with their B team. So there's players out there, but Securis and Vargas are sort of the two names I've got highlighted as these guys are right there and can really make a big jump in this world cup. Ellie, I want to ask you about Caleb Wiley. I know you're a big fan of him in Atlanta. What is he going to bring to this team? And it seems like the defending line is pretty strong for this group. I, I can see a lot of clean sheets, especially in the group stage with Gaga and goal, Caleb Wiley on the, the left. I think he plays right mostly on the left side. Um, and we have two strong center backs that we could play. I mean, Talk to us about Caleb Wiley and, and what he's going to bring. Um, I mean, Caleb Wiley, and from what I've seen from him this year and Atlanta, I mean, he can he's a pretty adaptable player that can be played. He's been um, filling in for the, um, I believe, attacking wing. Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, he's, he's been playing a lot of left wing for them this season, um, although he's been playing a lot of left back too. Yeah, and so getting to see, like, he's a player that I think can play box to box and play very effectively box to box. And so it's really, I think it's a really good choice on on the on this lineup to have him there because if like we're talking about having all these forwards who are down and gone, he can very easily slip into those positions and play well. Um, and on top of that, I mean, I think that that he's going to be fighting like crazy because I I think that he has a fighting chance at a backup behind maybe like Anthony Robinson for the senior national team. And so I think that he's going to be, this is his chance to fight tooth and nail and become a part of that conversation of like, we talked about Serginho Dest and Tim Wea coming and shining through in our last, in the 2019 world cup. So who's to say that Caleb Wiley's not one of those names that we start talking about now. And then, you know, come very, come even really pretty quickly in the future, we see his name up on senior team rosters. Um, and so I think I think it, it'll be interesting to see one where they play him, um, two if he plays you know the kind of same positioning and same everything as Atlanta or kind of what he does. So he's a name that I'm I'm looking at very very specifically. Yeah, and like I said in the beginning of this roster conversation, Darren Yappy, the player from Colorado Rapids, is the only true center forward that we have on this list. Um, so Ellie, who do you think is going to be is it going to be Yappy that's mostly playing at that number nine position? Or we've 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 seen Mikey Varas, the manager for this team, play with a pretty fluid front line where all three players in the attacking line are kind of interchanging positions. What do you think we're going to look like in that front attacking three? I'm not 
not entirely positive. Um, I'd like to say that, I mean, Kate Cowell, we've seen kind of rotates around and is pretty flexible um, as far as I've seen him play. Um, and so I'd like to, I, I would imagine that with, with the players I'm seeing, I would imagine a rather flexible um, front line once again. Um, and I would kind of imagine looking at the names that we have on this roster, I'd imagine a pretty fluid rotation from midfield to attacking as well, right? You have a good number of players that could also technically qualify as midfielders rather than just straight attacking. And so I think one of the greatest strengths of this roster is that it's a very fluid roster. And I think that yeah. we'll see, I think we're going to see it all tournament and that these players, while they might be, you know, currently designated defender, or midfielder, forward, I I don't think they're going to remain in those necessary, like, designations. I think that they'll probably be swapped around, and I have a feeling that's the same for positioning on the field, that these yeah. players are going to be kind of put to the test of, where can you play? Let's figure it out. Today you're trying this. Give it a shot. See how it goes. And and as strong as this roster is, looks, we're still missing some really key players or, or players that have played a, a really big role in this tournament or in the CONCACAF tournament before this. Um, Paxton Aronson kind of played in that false nine position a lot for the U.S. in that CONCACAF tournament. He's not going to be released by Frankfurt. We have Ricardo Pepe, who is age eligible, but the uh, coach, Mikey Varas, in the press conference after the roster release said that Ricardo Pepe has graduated to the senior team and it's not worth bringing him to the U-20 World Cup. Um, he's also probably going to be in line for a transfer as well in the summer. And then we have Caden Clark, who kind of like, came out of nowhere when he was 16 and 17 with New York, scored a bunch of goals early on and has really regressed since then. He's made the bench a few times for RB Leipzig, um, but really hasn't shown a lot in the last year when he was on loan at New York Red Bulls. So Tom, given what we know about the players that are here on this roster, the players that didn't make it for whatever reason, how do you feel about Ricardo Pepe not making this? Was that the right decision? And how far do you think we're going to get in this tournament? I, you know, I find it hard to be too broken up about players not being on this roster. And we've talked about this a lot on the It's Called Soccer Discord the last few days. This tournament, frankly, is mainly just for exposure for younger players. It's to get some first team minutes in high pressure situations. It's to get a chance for European scouts to really see what you can do in a big name tournament. If you are getting first team minutes in MLS or you are on the cusp of breaking through a first team in the top five, top seven league in Europe, not really sure that this is a tournament that's going to really have a lot of benefit for you as a player. So a player like Brian Gutierrez at Chicago, who's probably their best player. Um, we would love to have him here, but I'm not really sure that he's going to be discovered out of nowhere when he's already starting for Chicago fire or a player but like Discovery Pepe. is like discovery is one part of this, right? Like another is that as a player, you get to wear your, your nation shirt and you get to represent your country. True. And, you know, there's there's an argument for that, but there's not a huge correlation between success in this tournament and success at the senior national team level, um, just due to the nature of the tournament. And it's it would be great for us as Americans to, like, see them wear the colors and, you know, go far and have success in this tournament. But, you know, some of these players are never going to make it to the senior team level. Others are going to make it on the backs of club performances. So I, I, I just struggle yeah. to sort of really see how like get too broken up just because I feel like there is so much more to play for in other areas. Um, France had 28 players decline call-ups, Brazil, sort of similar numbers. When you look at it, uh, England, Spain, Germany, and France have all only won this tournament once. Um, so this is, there's just, you know, there's not as there's much. There's a lot of variability. Yeah, there's a lot of variability. Yeah. There's not a lot of prestige behind winning it. Um, so, yeah, I tend to just sort of, if you can break through, if, if Paxton Aronson, by not making this tournament, breaks into the Frankfurt first team and plays 1,500 minutes next year, then that's a positive trade off for the men's national team. Yeah. I feel like. Where Brian Gutierrez goes on to have score five goals for Chicago Fire and gets sold this next window, then. You know, he's also done a done good by himself for the senior national team, even though he's not getting the experience with the, the youth national team. There's only so far the youth national team can take you before you have to back it up on the field at the senior level. Look at a Richie Ledesma, look at a Ulysses Yanez, who in the last tournament 
played really well, but are still struggling to put it together at the senior team level. So yeah, yeah. it's, <laughs> this is a very long winded way of sort of saying like, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into this tournament and there's a lot of, there's trade-offs for yeah, there's, there's, players, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, there's trade-offs for both. I mean, France had a guy who was turned out, who, whose club turned out a call up because he was on the reserve for a Liga Liga do side who's fighting relegation. So it's not like you're getting like the top prospects, even like there's a lot of players who are getting club level minutes who are just needed elsewhere, especially with the senior world cup, pushing the Euro clubs even season back so late. It just created this really weird situation where clubs are overlapping into this, you know, international cycle. So yeah. How far do we get in this tournament, Tom? You know, I think that a quarterfinals appearance would be a very big win for this team. That's where we got last time. I semifinals would be huge for us. Um, beyond that, yeah, I, I think that it would be a shame if we didn't get out of the group stage and win a match. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Ellie, how far are we going? I'm going to just ditto that. Um, I, I don't know much about our competition. I'm not going to lie. I'm still dipping my toe in with the with the youth national team. So I'm not, but I agree. I think, I think it's always um, a good shout to, you know, group stage plus one win. Yeah. Always a good place to go. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on Fiji U20 rosters, but I doubt that they're going to be an amazing team that will put up a lot of resistance. But you never know with Ecuador, a South American team with young players, um, Slovakia, if that is the team. Did, it is. Did someone fact check me? Okay, great. <laughs> Slovakia, confidently. Um, <laughs> they might have some amazing players as well at the youth level. So make sure you're tuning into that. Also, if you, uh, we have basically another crazy summer of soccer happening. The U20 World Cup for the US. The US women's national team is going to be in a World Cup in July and August. The U20 women's team is going to be in the CONCACAF championship. And the senior men's team has Gold Cup and Nations League. If you want all of that in one coordinated calendar, I do have links down below in the description and I'll put it in the top comments. So if you want to download a Google calendar or an Apple calendar that has all of those games on it, it reminds you when those games are happening, make sure to download that. Um, All of that's free. Just go and download it. Watch lots of US soccer. Um, Okay, let's then talk about the transfer rumors that are happening currently starting to heat up. Uh, The first we have to talk about is going to be our guy Christian Pulisic, the is he Captain America or is Tyler Adams Captain America at this point? It's it, I, it's hard to say. say. He's he, you know <laughs> why, why not both? Okay, Captain America is maybe on his way out of Chelsea. Probably. I mean, we heard from Fabrizio Romano the other day uh, when he was joining the CBS network that Juve and Napoli are going to be uh, tracking Christian Pulisic. Uh, Juventus does not have a sporting director right now, so I doubt that they're going to be making any sporting decisions on who's going to be coming in. But I think Napoli, uh, their owner also just talked about how they want to sign one American and I think one Japanese player uh, for whatever reason. Who knows? Uh, But they want to do that. So maybe Christian Pulisic is that player. Maybe it's another player that we'll talk about in a second from Major League Soccer. Um, Newcastle also was in for Christian Pulisic during the transfer. Uh, the January window, but if you'll recall, Pulisic got injured um, trying to shoot and jammed up his knee, and that kind of held up the transfer at that point. So we have Newcastle, we have Juve, we have Napoli, we have like 10 other clubs that at some point have tracked or shown interest in Christian Pulisic. Ellie, where do you think Christian Pulisic is going to end up based on these rumors, and where do you think the best team for him would be? That's a great question and I think it's it's one that I've talked with many people and gotten so many different responses and I think it's a really you know it's a fun question to to explore um I would like to see him personally at Newcastle I think that'd be a really good place for him um a team that is maybe not maybe more of a mid-table team um but has had a really stellar year and so is still qualified for a champs league but not going to be one of those big four teams in the champs league that, you know, he's going to have to fight off a Kevin De Bruyne to get a starting position, right? Like that's, that's not what I'm personally looking for. I think that that's not good for him as a player. Um, I think any team that he goes to, in my opinion, it needs to be a like mid table team 
at a really good league. Um, I, I'm after having seen him at those top level teams, it's just, there's so much injury that's been happening and there's so much getting looked at, looked past because of X, Y, Z, because of this person, because they have the money to buy that person. And so, I mean, I think personally a mid table team, I think Napoli would be a pretty good shout. Um, I, yeah, but I don't, I, I don't know how much I support uh, one of those, one of the big clubs <laughs> that, you know, yeah. has all the money reserves and can just, when they decide they need to buy another player and replace him. Yeah. I mean, no matter how good you are, when you spend 80 million on Sterling and 110 million on Mudrick, like there's really only so much you can do. Tom, how would you feel about a front line at Napoli with Christian Pulisic and Irving Lozano? I would charge. I would, I would enjoy watching that. Frankly, it would be a lot of fun. (laughs) Um, I prefer him to go to any club that plays a 4-3-3, a true 4-3-3 that is actually going to play with true wingers instead of whatever the inverted stuff that uh, they were trying when Thomas Tuchel was at uh, Chelsea or whatever the 5-3-2 stuff is that Graham Potter was trying. It just sort of feels like Chelsea has tried to fit Christian Pulisic as a square peg into a round hole so Mm -hmm. many times. A place like Napoli where he's playing as a true winger in a 4-3-3 even with Chucky Lozano would be a lot of fun to watch. And Chucky and Pulisic would probably do really well together. They're both, I think, complementary players on the wing. So pair them with a strong striker and all of a sudden that Napoli team could be even more dangerous than they are now. Although that's yeah. kind of hard to do given how good of a season <laughs> they had. I do think that I do want them to stay away from sending him to Juventus. If at all possible, unless Allegri gets fired. Because I don't think I could handle seeing Pulisic <laughs> play the left mid in a 4-2. <laughs> Yeah, that would uh, give give me flashbacks of seeing Timothy Way at left back again. Um, what about, so if we think Newcastle, if we think Napoli, if we think someone with a 4-3-3 for Pulisic, uh, the Napoli, let's go back to Napoli because the owner did say he wants to sign an American. Someone that's been linked to Napoli over the last few days has been Jesus Ferreira from FC Dallas in Major League Soccer. Tom, you're laughing, but could this work? I mean, Osemen is one of the best players, one of the best strikers in Europe right now. And he's yeah. going to be sold for buku bucks in the summer transfer window. So Napoli will need a number nine to come in. But I don't know if the answer from Osemen, one of the best number nines in the world, to Jesus Ferreira is going to be the answer to continue to hold your title in Serie A. I- I'm notably not as big of a Jesus Ferreira critic as most people critic as most people. And I think that would be one of the biggest downgrades in the history of European <laughs> soccer. <laughs> um, if <laughs> if Napoli's buying Ferreira, it's probably to loan him out somewhere. I, I do think he could thrive in a team in Italy. I think that the, the tactical play of Italy suits Ferreira's game. But I don't think he's leading the line for Napoli at this stage of his career. I, I think that he yeah. would end up as a bench player and it would end up stunting his development. I, I would much rather see him start somewhere else. <laughs> Ellie, where where does Jesus Ferrer go? Does he stay at FC Dallas? Should he? Second division somewhere um, for some development. He can join George Bello in the two Bundesliga. They're about three to get Bundesliga. relegated. Three Bundesliga. Yeah. <laughs> Championship. Let's, let's look at um, any, any League Two. E- uh, the French, the French League Two. I'm gonna mispronounce that. Sorry, French. I even took French class. <laughs> um, All of our French listeners. <laughs> um, yeah, any second division team. I don't want him starting at those biggest um, clubs just yet. At those yeah. biggest, highest divisions yet. I think that he, like Daryl DK, and like so many other players we've seen at that attacking role, would just do wonderful with a kind of a, a second tier starter. Yeah. And then building up to that, I think that builds. I think Belgium and the Netherlands are usually good shouts for that as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Yunus Musa, one of the most important players for the U.S., has rumors swirling right now as scouts are tracking him incessantly at Valencia. Valencia is tied on points for the relegation zone, but they're currently uh, above that spot based on goal difference. Either way, I think Yunus Musa is gone from Valencia in the summer transfer window. He's shown enough through the World Cup and with his his game time at Valencia. Uh, Valencia is just a mess as well in general. 
So I'd be happy to see Yunus Musa move on. We've heard Arsenal. That's also where he started in the academy and then moved on to get first team minutes to Valencia. We have heard Leicester, which I think makes a lot of sense, especially if you consider that Yuri Telemans, their number eight, that plays very similarly to Yunus Musa, is going to be out of contract and likely going to a much larger team at the end of this season. They'll need to replace Telemans. So Yunus Musa might be the answer for that. We've seen almost every other club in the Prem be linked to Yunus Musa. I, th- I think his game translates really well to Arsenal. I don't know if he's necessarily at that level just yet, but he's he's not more than a year or two away from being in, in that Champions League position. Um, Tom, where does Yunus Musa go? Where, where does he fit? He's going to fit somewhere in the Premier League, I think. I think the big question right now is, is he match fit for 90 minutes? I feel like he's had some stamina issues this year in La Liga that he's going to have to work through to really stand out in the Premier League, especially at an Arsenal. So I maybe start with a liver, a Lester who are going to sort of give him time to develop a little bit more before he's thrust into those champions league minutes. But yeah, he's, he's really close. He just needs to get out of Valencia. He just sort of seems like a broken man right now by how, like how hard this season has been. I just, I, I want him to get a better playing situation. That's not the struggles yeah. of the Valencian relegation battle that he's been in. I think all of those players are probably on the struggle bus right now and, and feeling it a bit. Ellie, where do you want to see Yunus Musa next season? I don't know. I'm not going to lie. I hadn't, that's, I, I wish I could tell you I'd given it all the thought in the world, but I actually, that's, that's one move. All I know is away from Valencia as far as he can get <laughs> without looking back. Yeah. Um, I think the Prem would be a good move. Um, and I think he could develop well in the Prem. Now, where in the Prem? I'm not entirely positive. Um, Lester sounds pretty good to me right now. Um, I don't know. Unless they go down. <laughs> That's a big yeah. thing with Lester is if they go down, they're not going to be able to purchase Musa. So, yeah. um, I mean, I guess my my question to y'all is, is there a mid-table? I, I love those mid-table Prem teams <laughs> for, for our U.S. players, right? It's a great place to develop without getting overlooked. Like Arsenal, yeah. I, I would fear him being thrown on the bench and not being looked at again. Um, so, I mean, are there any other mid-table, men, mid-table teams that y'all are looking at and you're like, yeah, that worked pretty well? I mean, I think Palace and Aston Villa come to mind, uh, especially Aston Villa. I, I keep wanting to say Brighton, but I feel like they're starting to to build themselves into like a, a top six contender pretty consistently. And I don't know if they, they have a really great, recruiting strategy. So if they bring Yunus Musan, I trust that they have a development plan for him and that he will get playing time. Um, but I think Aston Villa or somewhere like Palace is a little bit safer where, you know, they're going to be mid table. Aston Villa, uh, since Emery has come on, has the second most amount of points of any team since Emery became coach. So they're not any team to sneeze at. Um, and they also play similarly to Brighton where they're kind of looking to transition, build into those moments, create possession from the back and, we know Yunus Musa's strengths are in possession, being able to transition from defense to attack. So I think he can he can be an asset and a value to a lot of Premier League clubs. But Tom, what do you think? I mean, I think that any of those clubs would really be good. I, I do think the Prem is sort of the perfect place for him. He's very press resistant. He's gonna he's not gonna be able to shy away from the physical battle. So I, I, I like specifically his skills and how they translate to the Prem. Um, I, I, Villa does seem like a good sort of spot to be just you know based on some of the players they've produced in recent years and sort of the physical profiles of them Mm -hmm. um yeah i think that a player like musa would be a good good investment for them all right let's finish out this episode with one player that you're looking for the move in this summer that we haven't talked about so anyone have a player ready haji wright Haji Wright has been killing it for two years in Turkey. Golden boot contender both of the last two years. I think like 30 goals over the last two seasons for Antalya Spor. They are looking for a 10 million plus move for him. And I think he gets it over the summer and goes to a bigger league. And hopefully we see him continue to develop because more nines in the hat is always a good Lord thing for the U.S. Lord knows we need more number nines. <laughs> always need a number nine. So let's, <laughs> let's hope that Haji Wright uh, can get his move over the summer. That's, that's one of the ones I'm really looking at. Ellie, who's your guy? I'm I'm between two. Um, Weston McKenney. I'm I'm watching that one pretty closely to see where he's gonna go. And I'm also looking at Chris Richards. I'm curious if he's gonna stay at Crystal Palace or if he's gonna move on. Cause he, when he was playing, 
was player of the month, but since then has not come back um, partially for injury. But I, I wonder if there's anything else in that in his way as well. And I would like to see if maybe another team does a little good for him. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at Chris Richards there. Nice. I'm going to pick Taylor Booth, who is at FCU Trek right now uh, in the January window. It was rumored that Manchester United were looking at him. I don't know how true that is, but uh, Utrecht is looking for 12 million plus for Taylor Booth. We'll see who is able to pay that, but that to me seems like a reasonable fee for a Premier League club, but an astronomical fee for any other club in the world looking to get Taylor Booth. So I think he's good enough to get to that league, but he probably needs another step from Utrecht maybe to a Feyenoord or a PSV. So we'll see. And that might be where he can link up with Ricardo Pepe. We can have some more teams with at least two Americans on them. All right, that is our episode for today. Let's leave with some last words for our viewers. Ellie, you want to start us off? Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready for the for for what's coming? Um, I'm sure no one will guess. Uh, support your local soccer teams. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Mid we're we're starting seasons out strong. There's so much excitement. Um, if you haven't learned the joy of lower league soccer in the U.S., oh boy, do I have many things to tell you because boy, it's it's a mess. But granted, <laughs> it's a fun mess. Um, the amount of pettiness I've seen just this season alone in Nisa is enough to make someone's head spin. Um, but boy, is it bringing me joy. Um, local soccer is fun. You can find friends. You can support a team. Um, so if you are looking for something to do this summer, find your local soccer club. Look near you. Find it. If you're an agent of chaos, find your local soccer club. Even if you're not, <laughs> like just enjoy watching soccer with people close to you that you can like befriend. Like super fun. Bring a drum. Scream. Shout. Dance. <laughs> sing. It'll be wonderful. You'll have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> off the podium now <laughs> tom what's your last word a lot of soccer coming up this summer a uh, lot of mls a lot of lower league stuff but also just a lot of national team stuff um hopefully everyone can find something that they enjoy out of the summer um get ready it's gonna be an exciting time i'm ready to sort of watch a lot of youth national team learn a lot about our youth players a lot of women's national team really excited for the upcoming world cup so yeah i hope everyone enjoys it cool. All right, my last word is watch NWSL. It's an amazing league, great quality. And also, please consider supporting on the Patreon or YouTube memberships. You will get ad-free episodes of the podcast. You'll get other exclusive benefits. Uh, there's a supporter lounge in the Discord where Tom gives you sneak peeks at the monthly rosters. And overall, it just helps support the independent coverage that we provide for U.S. soccer. So we thank all the Patreons that are there right now and YouTube members. If you do want to support us, make sure to check those out and see which one is best for you. Thank you so much for everyone watching, for everyone listening. Make sure to rate this uh, audio if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We'll see you next time on It's Called Soccer. Peace. See you guys.